we had a uh, mass casualty event here in Binghamton. Um, it was a, I don't know, I don't really understand if they ever got to the bottom of it, but it was a gentleman that uh, was not happy with his life. Yeah. And uh, he was at a social social venue, uh -huh. uh, American Civics Association building, where they taught uh, English as a second language and programs like that for uh, immigrants and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, he opened fire and took uh, 12 people down and then oh himself. Jeez, that that's just horrific. I mean, so how close by was that to you? And, you know, what was well, that we whole, the, we what was the the whole pivot, experience like? We were the pivot oh. funeral because technically we were mm, probably about four blocks away from the building <laughs> itself. So, um we got the call from the coroner. I we have always worked very closely with our coroner. Yeah, we are. We have a uh, um, a coroner's office, not a medical examiner's office. Mm -hmm. So he attends every unattended death. And um, there are four funeral homes in our area that covered the uh, coverage for sure. coroner removals. Yeah. So we got them all together at our funeral home, and uh, the four of us took turns going through the building going to the hospital, coming back, yeah. going to the building, going to the hospital, and coming back. It was a very long and torturous day, and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't ask anyone to relive it or wouldn't ask anyone to ever have to go through something like that. No, that's something that, that no one should ever have to do, and, and very few funeral, funeral directors, thankfully, have to do that. But, I mean, just – Kudos to you for for just doing that for the for the families. I think that's really what it had to come down to. I'm sure. Was it a situation where you volunteered to the coroner, or was it like everyone was in agreement type of deal where we all need to help on this situation? No, the the coroner's rotation's always been in place here. Uh -huh. So because we don't have um, per se removal services, or yep. the coroner is just one individual. He is not a uh, removal service himself right right so uh, that's how that comes about and um we've always done that and uh our coroner at that time was john prindle great guy and uh i know that he was so influenced by this event that he made a presentation on mass casualty events yeah. that he does present from not from he doesn't do it a lot because i know it wears on him but he does do it once in a while for uh, other corner organizations or yeah. uh, ME offices. Yeah, that's got to be really valuable in case that ever does happen. You want to have someone in your corner that unfortunately has gone through it to, to help that experience just make it go a little bit more smoothly, which is just horrible that it is even a consideration that you need to be prepared for something like that. Well, I mean, in the past, we had always practiced uh, mass casualty events at like uh, – the airport for a plane crash or, you know, uh, a very large fire. And we do the grid and all that yeah. that's, that's mandated by FEMA and uh, DMORT. But we never in a million years imagined it, it would be in a building, you know, right. in such tight quarters where it was yeah. just, uh, you're not getting out of here alive type of thing. Right. That's terrible. I mean, that was so close to you. Did, did people know who this guy was, the, the person that that did this act? Um, most of the people involved knew who he was, but to the general public, I guess he was a very um, sheltered loner type personality guy. Yeah. It was oh. it was it was one of these guys where um, totally the opposite of you'd never expect it. The yeah. People actually thought. Yeah, this guy was probably capable of it. Yeah, that's scary. And how was it? Did you have to deal with many of those families too? How how was that? That might have, that must have been just as tough we, as that day. We um, took care of one lady, a, a yeah. fabulous woman who had, was a volunteer over there, a teacher that volunteered over there, and yeah. actually her her funeral was covered by People Magazine, and uh -huh. we got some. Uh, pictures of that funeral in People Magazine. That's beautiful. I mean, that's a, a testament to the, the work you had to do. It's Her funeral tough. procession was seven miles long. Oh my! So how many cars would you guess? Well, what is, I can't even put that. Five hundred? Like, what does that even mean? 
Um, we got to the cemetery and probably waited 20 minutes. And probably longer than I should I should say longer than that. Wow. Wow. And I assume she was a, a younger, a younger lady ish, or at least man, that's um, just she was, oh, she was, terrible. She was old. She was older. She wasn't young. Young, yeah. but she was older. And well, I mean she was a, a pillar of the community. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's tough. I mean, good for you for doing that. It's just brutal. All right. Now that we started off on a on a brutal note, on a on what was the, <laughs> the best day? How how about your uh, your best day in your career as a in, in funeral service. What do you think that would be? Well, I've had a couple of good days. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's it. <laughs> I've had no. I I shouldn't say that. I've had a lot of days that um, um, put a smile on my face at the end of the day. I've dealt with a lot of great families. Um, yeah. I have a lot of great stories about people. Uh, one of my favorite stories is. Uh, when I first, uh, maybe I was in the business five years and we went on a house call mm -hmm. and uh, the gentleman had died in his recliner okay. and his wife, his wife was in the kitchen. So yeah. I was in the kitchen talking to her, just kind of laying the ground rules and finding out what, what we were going to do the next day when she came in. Sure. And um, I said, uh, if you want to take a minute and say goodbye to him, you know, I'll just stay out here and wait for you till you're done. Yeah. There were a couple other people in the house. And uh, she went over to his recliner and she helped, was holding his hand mm -hmm. and she was talking very nicely to him and Aww. telling him how much she was going to miss him. Oh, and uh, it was very sweet. And then she got a little louder and a little, <laughs> a little more annoyed that, okay. you know, he didn't pay the car insurance. He oh. said he was going to have the car inspected. <laughs> he didn't do this <laughs> and he didn't do that. So finally, I had to go in there and, and kind of say, okay, okay. <laughs> Take it easy on the poor guy. <laughs> yeah, he, he's gone. But when I see her, uh, I still see her once in a while, and we kind of mm -hmm. laugh about that because yeah. it it got the best of her at the moment. But, uh, sure. you know, he, he, he was probably instigating it from upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he was. That's great. But that was always a good, that was a good day. Yeah, yeah, it's good that you got to have those mixed in every now and again, sprinkle in to keep you going. Give us a give us a rundown on your career then. So, how did you get to where you are now, and um, what was it like in the the early years, and then throughout your your whole career because you've done a lot. Well, I think I think I have a fascinating uh, career myself. I, I came from outside the business, was never uh, no no one in the business. Yep, and uh, I said I went back to school thinking. What can I do that I never have to look for another job? So I kind of got that. Fair enough. <laughs> I kind of won that battle. Always so, in the uh, I, I started out um, with a, a great embalmer and a great mm -hmm. guy who taught me the hard way. Um, yeah. They did about 300 calls a year, uh -huh. and they had a crematory, and they had a house that you lived in right next door. Of course. And the crematory phone was there, and the funeral home phone was there. So um, <laughs> if you went on a call in the middle of the night and came back, his favorite saying was, if you don't need me, I'll be having coffee. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so that basically meant, you know, unless, don't bother me. <laughs> yeah, unless, unless the building was on fire and I'm asleep, don't bother him. So yeah, um, we, I saw everything there. I learned so much from him that sure. uh, I would never, ever trade it in a million years yeah and i feel so sorry for people who have people in the business that don't have to go through that situation who right don't have to feel that learning curve who yeah. don't have to be faced with something and just say you know well dad have somebody else do it or uncle john sure. have somebody else do it you know sure. and you had to do it yourself you had to learn and because of that, uh, my first job, I went to an interview and uh, he says, uh, geez, we just went on a call and we have a body. Would you like to do an embalming? So I said, sure, I'll do an embalming. Yeah. So I started and he left and he came back and he said, you're done. And uh, quick job. I said, I said, well, yeah. He said, well, you have the job. He said. I can't believe you're done, and I can't believe how great this guy looks. Wow. And 
And I can't believe that you aren't licensed yet. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. That's a, that's a good. So, it was like, um, I think I'm doing something right, Dad. <laughs> right. As soon as I left there, I called my old guy at the old place, and I said, you'll never believe what just happened. Yeah. So I told him, he said, I never had a doubt. <laughs> that's so cool. that really made my day that day. Very cool. So I started out that way, and then uh, I had an opportunity to buy a funeral home that was kind of floundering. Sure. So um, I bought that. And then because How I that process, that, what was that like? Yeah, it was it was different, but we brought it back from basically the dead to a, a, a funeral home that did some business. Good. And we found out that it was in an area where all the ground was polluted underneath it by a chemical spill. No kidding. So, um, I just freaked and, and bailed. Did you have so, a lot of jaundice bodies down there? What, what was happening? It was, uh, it was it was in an IBM area where there okay. was some chemical spills. So yeah. um, that just terrified me. So we put it up for sale and, and a guy bought it. And nice. then I bought another one um, in another town, not too far away. Wow. Okay. And then the funeral home, the last funeral home I bought was because a lot of different circumstances, but the biggest one was that the gentleman that ran it for uh, probably 25 years uh, lost his sight. So he couldn't work anymore. I started working there. And then at the end, it was, uh, I kind of had to buy my paycheck. <laughs> right, right. Because uh, it was going to go away. <laughs> if, I didn't, if I didn't step in, it was going to go away. Yeah. Wow. And and how was it going through all, all that uh, on the ownership side, you know, the process, the process of buying those funeral homes and then running and managing those? How was it transitioning from being on the funeral directing side prep room side to to doing that the business side because obviously it is very different well i have a good partner who doesn't mind the numbers part of it and he's really annoyed with the funeral part of it so we work great together Fair enough. i don't get in his way and he doesn't get in my way so that worked <laughs> out really well but i think the the best part of what i went through was that today today's millennials or whatever you want to call them or entitlements. I'm the perfect sounding board for those people because I was an employee. Right. And right. I am an owner. So mm -hmm. you have no argument with me. You you can't win an argument with me because yeah. I've done everything you're going to do and I continue to do everything you're going to do. So let's just do it. Right, right. It puts the, their mind in a perspective saying, hey, I've been here before and I've had, to, I've had to go through this and work through this too. Right. I mm -hmm. I, I, I don't hold myself to a, a standard above everyone else. I can rub elbows with anyone and feel comfortable. That's good because then you know, hey, I'm willing to go in there and do the work that you're willing to do. So everyone should be on that same level as me. Right. I think people truly appreciate that. Yeah. If you are willing to get in the trenches with them, that, mm -hmm. that sooner or later, they'll go to the wall for you, too. Yeah. That's, but I, that's think today, I think the biggest mistake today's owners make is you have the ability now to um, build morale in so many different ways. Okay. And it, it's not your people sitting at the funeral home doing nothing for 40 hours. It's not. Yeah. That's not it. Yeah, that's not it. The, mm -hmm. the days of you needing somebody in the building to answer the phone are long gone. Yeah. And I mean, I started out, there was pagers and <laughs> bag and bag phones. Right. Sure. So, and you and you called the newspaper and read the obituary to them word yeah. for word. OK, so now today we're so spoiled, but there's still owners that think people have to sit in the building for 40 hours a week. It's insane. Mm -hmm. You can bother somebody on the golf course just as easy as you can bother them in the basement. Wow. You know? I, I like that perspective. That's so tell me, tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, you know, what, what is your philosophy and the tactics that you use to build that morale? And then it seems like you have some flexibility as to like, Hey, if we don't have anything going on, get out of here type of deal or, or what, what does that look well, like for well, your funeral? First it, first it starts with the pay. You have to pay okay. your people what they're worth. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if I'm going to get Jimbo out of bed at three o'clock in the morning, I need Jimbo to answer the phone and say, yes. 
Right. So the dollar amount that Jimbo gets is probably not going to make my competitor happy because he's going to say I'm overpaying him. But yeah. at the same time, I know when I call Jimbo at three o'clock in the morning, Jimbo's getting up and going with me. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I also know that if I tell Jimbo to take off at two o'clock or not to come in at all, yeah, that Jimbo's also appreciative of that. Right, right. And then able to like if if something's going on, hey, like that's the break. So I, that's I I do like that a lot, and I think that's going to be a shifting trend because you see it in every other industry where, you know, people are able to work from home or work from different places. And obviously this is a very in-person business, but that doesn't mean we can't incorporate some of those different elements into the job too. That might attract some of that younger talent and make them go to bat for you too. Well, that, uh, I mean, uh, I see so much now of people not valuing your license. I mean, uh, there's a big push here in New York to get a, a lower classification of license. Well, why would you ever think that's a good idea? Why would what, you, why would you ever? So now, what I mean, is the reasoning? Do you think? Well, because there's such a shortage of funeral directors. Oh. Address, address the reason there's a shortage of funeral directors. Don't fill a void with something that doesn't belong in the funeral service. Pay your people. Support your people, give them a healthy life balance, you know, and and this is going to come off very weird. But if you have an answering service, put on the answering service. If this is not an emergency, call tomorrow right. during business hours. You know, oh. you're not expected to run back to the funeral home to check on how much money is in somebody's pre-need because it's their birthday. In, I know. In, it, it's it's it, it's unrealistic the output we put on ourselves. It's just unrealistic. We we don't need to be twenty four seven for other than death calls. Right. If it's not a death call, you don't have to be twenty four seven with you a hundred percent on that. And it just leads to more of the issue that you're talking about, Joe. Is like people don't want to work in funeral service because. We're doing all these things, bending over backwards and making sure we're answering every single call and, and jumping through hoops to get back to the funeral home to check that pre-need. Like that stuff is just crazy. And, and it's unfortunate because we've done it to ourselves because of years and years and years of funeral directors going that extra mile, which I do think is a good thing. So don't get me get me wrong. But oh, no, like I, I, I'm on the same page with those, you. you know, like catering to those little needs that it's like, this is not necessary at 1030 at night for me to have a 20 minute conversation with Nancy Drew about her, her uncle's funeral four months ago. Like that's crazy. Like that stuff just drives me up a wall. No. no, I was just sitting here thinking about the bill and I had a question about it. Yeah. Okay. Call me tomorrow. Right. I'd be glad to help you out, but you should realize I'm in my bed. I'm not at my desk. So I can't help you anyway. Right. There's nothing I can do in the first place. Uh, that is, you know, that I is don't, I so don't have true. a computer open on the nightstand yeah. with your file. Despite but, what people I mean, think. Yeah. On that same note, I mean, we did that to ourselves with cremation, too. We opened that door and let cremation in, never giving it a thought that it was going to take such a hold. But you had three calls going on, and somebody called and said, well, I was thinking about direct cremation. And all of a sudden you said, yeah, that's a great idea because I'm busy. And now look where it's gone. And now it's like you need those calls and you need those families. And now people are fighting elsewhere. People are fighting over direct cremation calls. Yeah, absolutely. It's, people are fighting it's, over every call. It's, it's, it's the way it is. And uh, whether we like it or not, that's been the, the trend for a long, long time. So it's up to us to adapt to it and make sure that we're the ones providing a service that is meaningful and valuable to those families, regardless of what the situation is. Well, I, I've always said that you're totally in charge of that number yourself. And, and if you can make a difference in a cremation service, like a lot of funeral directors, I know they say, OK, so that's the end. They come in, do the paperwork. That's the end. Well, yeah. if they have a service, I'm going. Right. 
And if I if they have a service, I'm bringing a book and I'm bringing prayer cards and I'm bringing thank you cards. And I don't care if I, I charge for them or not, but right. people are going to see me and I'm in direct traffic and may or may not get in the way. But <laughs> you you have to put up with me because th this is my job. I'm right. I'm there for you. Yeah. That's that's what it is. No matter what the city, like you got to be there for them, and then always showing that face, being present, showing someone from the funeral home is engaged with what they're doing and actually providing some value and assistance is critical. I think I totally agree with you. I think that's I, and we've missed that boat too because yeah. as 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 a uh, organization or as a career field, generational generationally we've got lazy, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I. I see it all the time where I loved your dad, but you're a jerk. Yeah. And, all the time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I don't know how people are still coming to you because you're you're kind of not your dad. Right, right. Oh, that's tough to swallow sometimes and just it's the the way it the way it goes. I well, what do you think for for the future of our industry? I know that I we talked before and you were contemplating, you know, uh retirement at some point in the future. So where do you see yourself going uh, in, in the next few years? And then what about our industry as a whole? Cause, because it seems like you have some pretty good perspectives that not a lot of people have that, that have been in the service, you know, for 20 plus years. Well, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay. If it gets better. Um, How so? I, I think uh, a lot of areas where there's uh, too much competition, yeah. Um, you're going to see people closing doors unless they five years ago, I, I put a consolidation plan together for our area because we have 23 funeral homes in one county. It's it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit crazy. What's the so I put a consolidation like? plan together to say, hey, let's work together, you know, and then we can we can form a common bond. We could, you know, we could we could pool our money and pool our resources and pool our talent. Yeah. And pool, pool our part timers. But of course, you, no. you know the big the three letter word that comes with being a funeral director. Uh -huh. You're shaking your head. I know you know it. Ego. Yeah. And ego rules the roost. So yeah. that fell by the wayside. But now I see that uh, behind the scenes, people are working together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so it's now becoming it's more and more connected. Circle. It's coming full circle, but I don't know if it's too little too late. Yeah, but I, 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 I don't think, think so. I like I to have he, an optimistic look at it, but I, I do he, agree uh, that people are coming coming together um, behind the scenes a lot more than when I first started my career. Like It was very still cutthroat, but I, I sense <laughs> those changes coming, and now I'm really seeing it where people are teaming up more, and it's like, hey, we're all – sort of in this together too at the same time. So we need to, we need to pool uh, the, those abilities and those uh, the resources, like you were just saying too. I, I, I do agree. But I think, I don't know, are you uh, right in Chicago? I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think areas like you are going to see a lot more re removal services. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and direct disposers. Yep. What we like to call here in New York the race to zero. Yeah, yeah, it is literally. <laughs> literally, it's the race to zero. How much can I make? Can I make zero? Give it to me. I'll yeah, do it I want to make zero exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not getting out of bed for zero. So I, I think I think we're on that trend, but I have noticed that COVID had one effect, and now it's coming back to um, to bite us is that uh, we went through it in our own family here. My wife's mother died, or my wife's father died during the height of COVID, yep. and we couldn't do anything. Yep. We were literally handcuffed. We couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So we went to church, and we went to the cemetery. And that was and that. church was horrible. It was every other pew, and three people in a pew. It, just, it was a ridiculous scenario. Just yeah. no way to run a funeral so yeah. then not too much down the road his wife died my mother-in-law mm -hmm. and we did the same thing and it's it's not it's not sitting well 
It's mm-hmm. it's just not sitting well that it it wasn't. It's not not that you need pop and circumstance and and uh, mm-hmm. over the topness, but maybe you need a little more something. I mean, yeah. both of them were private, so we saw none of our family and friends other than immediate family. Yeah. So it's kind of unfair to them that that's right. how they had to go out. Not doing the, the justice that they deserved, I would say. Yeah. I mean, you say a life well lived, then we need to prove it at the end that it was a life well lived. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You got to do some something to... It's that finality, and a lot of people don't aren't experiencing that as much now. Is the way I feel, and it just it helps with with the people that are still around. Like that's what people don't understand. I think that aren't in the industry. Like that's what it really is about. But other people see it as like this is just disposing of the a person, problem. and that's like it. A problem. Yeah, like, like it's a pro- literally like it's a problem. Yes. Yes. And the other thing that I noticed is that people don't even realize people have gone because of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, oh, no, he died. What are you talking about? That yeah. can't be. Oh, yeah. During COVID, he died. But there was nothing in the paper because there was nothing. <laughs> there was nothing. Right. There was nothing to put. Yeah. And then the other Crazy. problem here. I don't know if you're experienced. Are you with Gannett out there? Gannett Corporation? Is that your paper? Mm -hmm. Okay. Everything here is owned by Gannett Corporation. Okay. Right now, today is what? Wednesday? Uh Uh-huh. So if you died today and I sent an obit in tomorrow, Mm -hmm. it would appear on Monday. What takes so long? That's how they do it. What if a family wanted, like, what if they had a quick turnaround? No. My funeral home here in Binghamton is predominantly Jewish. Okay. So that is next Which day. Which is immediate, right. Next day, next, right. Next day or two days, tops. And I, I have not put a, a Jewish obituary in the paper in almost three years. Oh, my gosh. That's not fair. That's not fair to those people that, you know, and, aren't able to have that they, if they, they want. Have no, they have no issue with it whatsoever. They have no issue with it. Bizarre. That is bizarre. So, if they're, so, so, Mike, throw in a holiday. Okay. And now you're two Good days luck. more out. So, <laughs> so you'd, you'd, you'd have Try to print in the funeral 10 days away <laughs> to get it in the paper. It's freaking crazy. I, I can't even plan it now that it will be, even if I, if, even if I say the next three days are out, we have to do it on the third day. Yeah, I can't get it in the in the paper the morning of. It so sense. it's like I, I'm just sense. telling people, write it as fast as you possibly can. Send <laughs> it to me. I will get it on my website as soon as it's on my website. Every other website will steal it. Yeah, and we'll get it out there as fast as we possibly can. But you got to get it to me first so we can do it. Yeah, and then we just leave the paper completely out. Yeah. I uh, mo- I feel like the vast majority at this point are leaving that out because it's gotten it has gotten really expensive for that and you know people just share it you know via their own funeral home website and whatever other websites too and it just that's that's the way it, it spreads a little bit more easy uh, in that respect now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Last question. So I, I hinted at it before. Uh, where do you see yourself now um, for the, for the rest of your career? What does that look like for you? And um, yeah. Well, you, this is probably going to shock you, but uh, I am thinking about retiring. Uh, my wife has retired, but has gone back to work as a consultant already. So I was going to say, you got too works. much fire. You got too much fire to be, <laughs> well, to be quitting I, I on think, us. Come on now, Joe. <laughs> well, she was, a, uh, she was an administrative director at uh, one of the um, psychiatric hospitals here. Wow. So she, was a, so she got an offer to be a consultant. So... She couldn't really say no. It's a good, good yeah. gig. But um, I'm contemplating right now, believe it or not, looking at the other end and saying, yeah. maybe I want to sell uh, final expense insurance. Right, right. Yeah. And help on that end and be an advocate on the other side. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I'm sure there's people out there selling final expense insurance that have never seen the inside of a funeral home. There are many, many. <laughs> so 
I'm thinking about that because um, I can do that from anywhere. True. True. And uh, we do have another house on a, a nice lake in another state, not New York. And wow. uh, I wouldn't mind uh, picking up and spending some time out of town because That's I really awesome. haven't had the chance to do that. And I'm really looking forward to just, I don't, I don't know yet if I'm just going to set my uh, cell phone on fire <laughs> or if I'm going to actually bury it. But I'm going to do one or the other. Cremation or burial for the fall. Cremation what are we going to do here? Uh, good just, stuff, just, Joe. But just the uh, the outlook of not being tied to the phone 24-7-360. I've never used an answering service. Wow. That's impressive. I've always been a live voice. So yeah. I'm very proud of that. Yeah, that's I know that's people, not people, people, to do. people call me names, but I'm very proud of that because I don't want to hear an answering machine right right. i want to hear i want to hear joe's voice or i want to hear jim's voice or i want to hear somebody's voice yeah i don't want to hear somebody i don't know tell me that they'll see if they can find somebody to help me i don't i don't no i don't i don't want you i want i wanted to make this phone call to to the person that is going to help me right my brother followed me in the business and he said well i think i want to be a trade man and i said Okay, mm-hmm. here, I'll give you one hint, okay? If you're going to be a trade man, you have to lose one word out of your vocabulary. No. What are you talking about? I said, you can't say no. You cannot. Well, what if I say no? I said, they'll move to the next person on the list. Yeah. And, and they will never gone. call you again. Yeah. Because they didn't want to call you in the first place. Now you've made them make another phone call. <laughs> yeah, not going to happen. Not, exactly. not a good look. <laughs> that is a fact. That is a fact. You know, there's not too many trade guys that say no. No, you have to. It's a yes. It's a yes it's guaranteed good. yes game. <laughs> right. It, you're, you're better off not answering the phone than saying no. Yeah, you really are. <laughs> you really are. Joe, this has been, this has been good stuff. We, uh, we want to wish you all the best that hopefully we get some time in the lake with uh, some cell phone free time. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. It was a 